So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Mark McKinney. He's the Director of Cyber and Physical Security for Tetra Tech's US Infrastructure Division. He's a recognized leader in technology, cybersecurity, risk management, designing active and passive measures to prevent unauthorized access to facilities, materials, information, equipment, and personnel. His professional portfolio spans critical infrastructure operations across water, wastewater, energy, transportation, nuclear, public safety, and defense intelligence. Mr. McKinney advises several congressional uh, committees tasked with protecting America's critical infrastructure and national security. He advises the U.S. Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works on legislative initiatives designed to strengthen cyber security and physical security controls, protecting critical infra infrastructure. He is one of the original authors of America's Water Infrastructure Act uh, of 2018, and he's currently working with the Senate Committee to advance enhancements to AWI and other water security legislation, including the President's Industrial Controls System Security Initiative. He also advises two House subcommittees, the Homeland Security uh, Subcommittee on Cybersecurity and the Infrastructure Protection and Innovation, and the S Homeland Security Subcommittee on Transportation and Maritime Security, both of which support the House Homeland Secur Security Committee. Uh, he's also a consulting member of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security National Protection and Programs Directorate, and he's a retired U.S. Army Signals Intelligence and Force, Opera Force Protection Officer. So please uh, welcome Mr. McKinney to the stage. You guys got all that, right? <laughs> so, all right, good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Today, we're going to start the day off, right? We're going to talk about federal legislation that is designed to protect critical infrastructure, specifically water systems operations. Water has historically been overlooked, if you will, from a security and cybersecurity perspective. Water really hasn't been a target for threat actors until the last couple of years. Two years ago, water was number 12 out of 16 Department of Homeland Security defined critical infrastructure sectors. Last year, water earned the dubious title of number three behind finance and uh, energy. That's not a title you want to have right now. So water is now getting some attention, if you will. Let's see if we make the clicker work. I'll skip the uh, introduction here. This is for just my contact information. If you have any questions for me, please reach out anytime. <clears throat> All right, a little bit of background here. <clears throat> water is now third out of 16 in terms of reported numbers of cybersecurity incidents directed against system operations. Uh, last year, there were more than 100 reported cybersecurity incidents that were directed against community water systems. More than 50 have been reported so far in 2022. Now, when we talk about a reported incident, that means that there was measurable impact. Uh, there was measurable damage done, meaning something was stolen, something was broken, something was taken. So that's what loosely defines right now a reportable incident. Power has very clear definitions of what is a reportable incident versus what is not a reportable incident. Water is heading in that direction. Water systems operators are now classified as strategic national security assets. That is really important to remember because now you have access to federal resources that you didn't have before because water has been classified and specifically drinking water has been classified as a strategic national security asset that elevates water to the levels of energy, to military assets, to aviation. Now you're gonna see a lot more resources become available for you in terms of protecting your control systems um, out there. There has been about a 400% increase in attempts to compromise critical infrastructure across all sectors and since the beginning of 2020. What happened in 2020? had this pandemic thing start up. So you're seeing increased activity under the guise and under the shroud of that pandemic. Prevailing research indicates that about half of the global ransomware attacks are directed against operators of operational technology and industrial control systems. When we say ICS, think SCADA in this case. SCADA is common across several sectors. We're gonna talk about that here in just a bit. <clears throat> I uh, wouldn't be a good consultant if I didn't talk about some stats here. So reported losses that are attributed to cyber crimes have more than doubled since 2018. What are the threat actors doing? They're using phishing scams, impersonation scams, stealing credentials, trying to break into these systems and impersonate or masquerade as a legitimate user. 
trying to insert virus, trying to insert malware. <clears throat> they are conducting what are considered broad denials of service attacks. Um, during the pandemic, there were a number of incidents directed against call centers. What a denial of service means is that you publish, you, a threat actor puts out some sort of an incident, panics the public, the public starts calling in. Hey, I just got a notice that hospitals are closing or the water's gonna be turned off. What happens? They flood your call center or they flood your online portal. That's a denial of service. You're denying service to legitimate users because you put out some fake information using that. <clears throat> They're using tactics that uh, try to extort money. Two motivations for attacks against uh, the water sector. One is to hurt people and cause problems. You get in, you make, uh, make some change to the SCADA, you can actually poison the water. This is, uh, you could do this post-treatment. The other is to extort money. <clears throat> There's always a financial motivation uh, somewhere hidden in these. So <clears throat> using scareware of some sort <clears throat> to uh, try to uh, pull money out of the victims. Most popular is ransomware. There have been actually several incidents of ransomware uh, attacks directed against water utilities. In every single one of those incidents uh, and instances, the utility ended up paying up because they weren't able to recover their operation without getting those decryption keys. In 2021, we had just over $6.2 trillion in reported global losses. Now this is global, but that's a pretty good sized number. Think of the global economy, think of our economy. You know, we have what about a $20 trillion economy, 6.2 trillion in global losses attributed to cyber attacks. There have been, uh, last year, there were a little more than 30,000 incidents reported to a number of reporting and federal agencies. This is the uh, Internet Crimes Complaint Center, FBI manages that, DHS has a hotline. And every utility in the country has an FBI point of contact. Those FBI points of contact also track and trace and report uh, anything reported to them. Uh, last year, there were more than 3,000 attacks that were directed against utilities. And when we say utilities, think of water utilities and energy or power utilities. <clears throat> I know this is hard to read. You'll be able to see this when you get the uh, the copy of this. But really, what <clears throat> what I wanted to show here is the progression, if you will, of the attacks and the types of attacks. This only goes back to 2010, but we have uh, history dating back to the late 90s, uh, actually, that are uh, really attributed to what we now refer to as cybersecurity incidents. <clears throat> um, traffic management systems. Those use a SCADA. Traffic management systems are now being attacked. Think of what could happen if uh, a threat actor were to get into a TMS for a major municipality and start changing the, the functionality of the lighting systems, the traffic management signaling systems, cause traffic chaos out there. Now, why would you do that? Uh, just to cause a traffic jam? Not necessarily. If you wanted to carry out some sort of an attack, how do you keep the first, uh, the first responders from getting where they need to be? Put a traffic jam in their way. <clears throat> Fire can't get to where they need to go. Police can't get to where they need to go. These are the kinds of things that municipalities are starting to face. Um, I uh, highlighted the uh, Mirai botnet attack. There were about 145,000 Internet of Things devices. Think of uh, all of the devices that you're now deploying as part of your control system technology and your operating operational technology environments. You're pushing intelligence, you're pushing these devices further and further out to the edge. The closer they get to the edge, the further they get away, they get away from you and your SCADA, the more vulnerable they are. Think of all this intelligence and all of this automation that you're pushing out there. It's not a bad thing, but <clears throat> you have to make sure that you account for all of that intelligence that can be compromised, that can be captured, that can be used against you. A um, couple over on the far right over there, uh, last year there were two major incidents that really underscored the need for some sort of federal guidance, if you will, uh, for the water sector. First was a very large Virginia metropolitan water utility was victim of a ransomware attack. <clears throat> Took them about three weeks. They had to manually operate their drinking water system for about three weeks. They, their SCADA was taken offline. Every device was erased and it caused a major problem. They had to roll trucks. They had to roll technicians out and manually operate pumps. They had to go and manually operate <coughs> lift stations. Think about you know, the issue that you would have as an operator. If you had to go roll trucks, 
to manage your environment out there. That's what happened to this utility. And this is a large metropolitan utility. But really, what, <clears throat> what really got the attention of the federal regulators, and as you heard in the introduction, I, I've worked with uh, many regulators, is an attack on a small Tampa area water utility. February 5th of last year, uh, the city of Oldsmar, Florida was the victim of a, an attack against the SCADA. We think it was an insider, but we, we can't definitively prove that. What happened was a threat actor was able to use a remote access capability, get into the SCADA, <coughs> and change the set point for the sodium hydroxide, dialed it up to over 100 times the safe level. This is post-treatment. Fortunately, the system operator saw this, dialed it back down to where it's supposed to be before anything happened, before the SCADA actually executed that instruction set, and then terminated remote access. <clears throat> now, why would you know a small bedroom community just outside of Tampa get national attention? Well, this is the one that went public. Their process was to bring in the local sheriff. Now, most PDs are not really equipped to uh, investigate these types of cyber crimes. They're going to come in, they're going to look at it, they're going to say, yep, something bad happened, but that's about all they can do. They don't have the tools, they don't have the capability. Larger police departments are developing this capability. But really, where this investigative capability lies is with the federal government, starting with the FBI. All of you here who are system owners or operators, you have an FBI point of contact. If you have an incident, or you suspect you have an incident, or you just simply want some additional training or guidance, you can reach out to that point of contact. They'll come and they'll give you that guidance. If you think you had an incident, they'll come and they'll help you investigate that. But typically, the investigator is going to start with the FBI and then go from there. In the case of uh, Oldsmar, FBI came in, sent a, they sent a, a team up from the Miami field office. Uh, they looked at it a couple hours later. They elevated it to the Secret Service. Why the Secret Service? Secret Service doesn't have boundaries. Secret Service has capability to investigate beyond basically the boundaries of the United States. Secret Service then designated this attempt to actually compromise as a terrorist threat. The FBI actually already flagged it as a terrorist incident as well. This is typically how this works when you start investigating and uh, start trying to classify an incident directed against a utility out there. DOD was brought in. Why was the Department of Defense brought in? We didn't know if it was China. We didn't know if it was Iran. We didn't know if it was some you know, nation state trying to break in and do something. Does anyone remember what was happening on the weekend of February 5th? 5th was a Friday. Super Bowl. Where was the Super Bowl being held last year? Tampa. So <clears throat> we think this was simply to cause some problems near a major event. Fortunately, nothing happened, but this just underscores the need for water system operators to really be vigilant. But how do you do that? Where do you start? What resources do you have in place? That's what we're gonna talk about here next. Please, if you have any questions, please stop me. So <clears throat> just a little bit of uh, uh, venture outside of water right now. So critical infrastructure attacks uh, go beyond water. <clears throat> Power, offshore wind is even a target now. So you can see here that there were cyber attacks that disabled floating rigs for about 19 days. They were actually offline longer than that. That was in 2020. What this underscores is the, <clears throat> the threats that all this uh, in industrial IoT faces, all this intelligence you're pushing out further and further. You think they have a control center sitting out on a, on a, uh, a wind turbine? No, they control those remotely from hundreds or thousands of miles away. These wind turbines were compromised. Uh, in this case, uh, there were about 30,000 Biosat satellite terminals that were compromised. So they're going even farther. Think of uh, what would happen if our GPS system was compromised. So that has actually happened uh, in the past. They were able to recover quickly, the operators of those, those satellites, but they're vulnerable. And so now we're trying to push better protections up for those. Let's talk about control system security. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that many control systems share a common architecture. Typically, they use a SCADA. They rely on some sort of a SCADA. They are classified by operational technology environments, typically separated from your business network. Think of uh, your front office network where your customers come in and pay bills. 
your back office is going to be where your operational technology lives. That's where your SCADA lives. That's where you control that treatment. That's where you control that distribution. You control those pumps, those lift stations out there. Field control, <clears throat> wireless access. A lot of you have radios deployed out there. You have uh, sites that you can't even get cellular to. I'm uh, based out of Florida, and we have a lot of sites out in the middle of the swamp that we can't get cellular connection to. So what do we do? We bounce radio off of the nearest uh, the nearest control point. It's the only thing we have. So think of the sectors that are similar. Water and wastewater all use SCADA. Energy, the electric subsector uses SCADA. A lot of the vendors that sell SCADAs for water also have a companion SCADA for the power side. Oil and gas, <clears throat> that refinement process, that distribution process, pushing oil, pushing liquefied natural gas through those pipes, it's all done with a SCADA. Um, <clears throat> maritime control systems, bringing a ship into port, that's all done with a SCADA. Those ships are actually guided in using SCADA technology. Transportation control systems, like I mentioned earlier. So you can see there are a lot of similarities here. So what we want to do is try to come up with a set of common cybersecurity controls that can be applied more broadly and then get more focused. That's what's happening at the federal level. A little bit of background here on IoT. I mentioned industrial IoT. Uh, we estimate there are about 40 billion industrial IoT devices connected globally. Think of that. All of these devices could be, you know, the size of this device right here or smaller. It has intelligence to do its job, but it doesn't have a firewall. It doesn't have any sort of security control on it. It's the last thing these, uh, these developers and these manufacturers are thinking about is how to protect a device that's sitting out controlling a pump somewhere. But <clears throat> you can see remote access, big issue. We have to look at remote access. Most of these devices do not encrypt uh, the data that they, uh, that they transact. Think of that, you can capture SCADA information, use that SCADA information maybe to hijack these devices. We have devices scattered across large geographic areas. Think of your own service area, how large those are. All of these devices are all over the place. Um, <clears throat> IoT devices commonly share information with one another. Think about how your SCADA functions. Um, threat actors try to inject malicious code. If they can take control of one pump site or one lift station, and they can take control and actually hijack that device, they can move laterally across your entire OT network out there. They can eventually work their way back to your SCADA. This is what we wanna bring, bring attention to here. Now, again, what has the pandemic done? Drove a lot of us home. Uh, think about 100% of many workforces were sent home back in 2020. Never been done before. A lot of things came up. Look at what uh, a typical home network has. They're relatively unprotected. Now, what are you doing when you send someone home? They're having to now log into your corporate network or to your utility network from their home network, right? <clears throat> now you do it through a VPN of some sort, but think about what you're doing. You're exposing your utility network to that home network. Look at all the junk and the crap you've got, especially if you have kids. You have consumer grade hardware. You got a $50 Wi Fi router that you bought at Best Buy. Yeah, it says it has a firewall on it. Yeah, we have a firewall. It's worthless. I can break into a firewall in a Linksys firewall in a Linksys uh, Wi Fi router less than 30 seconds. <clears throat> Easy to do. Uh, weak encryption, if it's even enabled. You have chatty appliances. People, uh, for some reason, you know, think about your kitchen appliances. If you do, say, a home uh, remodel or something, these kitchen appliances now are internet enabled. You can actually connect those to your home network. <clears throat> I've never actually been on, you know, Interstate 4 or 417 and thought, you know, I think I want to log into my stove and turn it on so that when I walk in, the stove is already preheated and I can shove that casserole right in there. That doesn't really <clears throat> dawn on me, but some people want to do that. I don't need my fridge to tell me I'm low on milk. I can open the door, look and see I'm low on milk and go get it. So, but think about that. These chatty appliances don't have any protections on them, but people do enable them. Gaming consoles, you have kids or you're a gamer yourself. These things are wide open. <clears throat> my son is a gamer and I have actually had several attempts to try to compromise my home network through that gaming network. Now he's off on his own uh, network segment. I've got him beat, uh, uh, VLAND off by himself <clears throat> on that thing. Cellular devices can bridge networks. Printers, if you're running a home printer, 
and it's got wireless capability. So you can take your phone and actually print something directly to it. I can do what's called war driving, drive by, find that printer and actually take control of it and break into your network there. Same can be done with an office environment. Unsecured video conferences. And then finally, personal assistance. I'm not gonna ask the question, I'm a teacher. So I teach for a university in Florida. But I always add the first night or first session that I have with my, my students, I say, how many of you have these Amazon Alexa devices or these Google Home, these Google Doc things? And I see a bunch of hands fly up and I said, good, you're doing it wrong. <clears throat> Those devices are always listening. Those devices are not protected. Everything you say is being recorded. <clears throat> then I start seeing them, oh, good, I better disconnect these things. So then at the end, a lot of them are proud as, yeah, I turned that thing off. Great, now you're headed in the right direction. But those personal assistants are also making you vulnerable. Let's talk about some of the legislative initiatives that have been put in place over the last several years that have laid the foundation for what we're seeing now being applied to the water sector. Back in 2013, uh, the president signed uh, Executive Order 13636 titled Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity. What this did was task NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, to come up with a common cybersecurity framework, common set of standards. From that NIST special publication 853, Guide to uh, Cybersecurity for Federal Information Systems, which is now referred to as the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. You may have uh, heard of this. NIST CSF is the foundational framework that the federal government uses now, and you will see that in pending legislation that's impacting water. Power's already headed down this road. Power was, uh, was regulated about 17 years ago. It was chaotic, it was painful, but power is about 15 years ahead of the water sector. Water's headed in that direction. Uh, EO 13800, strengthening the cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure laid additional groundwork. This was signed into law in, in 2017. <clears throat> what this intended to do was to give the federal government additional oversight. Now the feds are starting to reach out to critical infrastructure operators, water system owners and operators, and start looking at these systems. How vulnerable are they? Are you using 30-year-old technology out there? Many are. Should you upgrade that technology? How should you upgrade it? If you're a water uh, drinking water operator, you're familiar with AWEA, and I always hesitate when I actually admit that I was one of the original authors for AWEA because it's kind of a love-hate thing. But AWEA was not intended to be one and done. AWEA was intended to be the first step in a series of steps. If you went through the AWEA assessment, you could do a self-assessment or you could hire uh, a third party. Uh, you, you saw that it was very, very comprehensive, a lot of detail in that. But what it was intended to do was to force you as an owner operator to take a hard look at everything connected to your system. How reliable is that system? How secure is that system? How safe is that system from outside intrusion? How safe are those assets from any sort of an outside impact? So it was really intended to get your, to get your attention focused on the right things. Very comprehensive. Uh, we're now looking at AWEA 2.0. I'll describe that here in just a bit. A couple of more here. Uh, Executive Order 14028, Improving the Nation's Cybersecurity, basically directed us, cyber, the, uh, the congressional advisory groups, to propose a framework for modernizing security for our critical infrastructure. That is in process now. Uh, National Security Memorandum on Improving Cybersecurity or Critical Infrastructure Control Systems, which was signed last July, established guidance for securing ICS networks, securing OT, securing SCADA. So you're starting to see some of those controls get published. What did NSM5 do? It declared industrial control system security a national security priority. I mean, think about that. It wasn't before. It is now. Um, I thought that water was overlooked for too many years. I mean, if our water gets compromised, how bad is that? So we really need to take a hard look at this. And it classified water systems as strategic national security assets. Keep that in mind. That's really important because that opens up additional resources for you as system owners and operators. This was part of the president's industrial control system security initiative, which was signed last July. <laughs> um, it, 
forced us to define a common set of security controls for those control systems. We have done that. So you're starting to see some of that get published now. We looked at deploying technologies and systems that provide threat visibility. You're not in competition with your neighboring utilities, right? If you're a water system, are you competing with anyone? No, you're not in competition. Why would you not want to share information with your neighboring utility out there? If they see something that could impact you, hey, we got a guy try to break in and do something bad, you wouldn't want to know about that, right? There's not a need to hide that information. Now, do you want to publish that out to your, to your uh, metered customers? Maybe not. That's where the Oldsmar thing kind of popped up. You want to look at uh, provisions for detection and warning. There are alerting systems that you can subscribe to. Facilitate response capabilities. You want to make sure that if you, in fact, are a drinking water site and you had your ERP assessment as part of your OEA, go back and take a look at that. In Florida, <clears throat> a lot of most of our utilities in Florida do a pretty good job on their ERPs because we constantly face the threat of hurricanes. We've had utilities that are, you know, that were completely flooded under, you know, 20 feet of water, and they were back up and running in two, three weeks. I mean, that's impressive. Now we're expanding that ERP capability to the control system side. And then defining sector and industry specific performance goals. We have to set, you know, a goalpost somewhere. What's been happening? 21 bills have been proposed across several Senate and House committees. Uh, as was mentioned, I uh, advise a Senate committee, the Committee for Environment and Public Works. That's the committee that oversees water and wastewater. And I also advise the House Committee for Homeland Security. That's the committee that oversees the Department of Homeland Security, as well as about a dozen other critical infrastructure sectors. So we're seeing this across the board. Four bills have been passed. They've been signed into law. Four bills for specifically water sector cybersecurity and resilience are currently in committee, expected to be passed and signed this year uh, as soon as Congress gets back in session. Three bills designed specifically for control system security. And again, for our purposes, think of SCADA in this case. There are four bills in play right now for incident response. There's actually a bill that was passed that is going to require owners and operators to report incidents. Now, they haven't figured out exactly how to report that yet and how to keep it quiet. We have, uh, you know, in certain states, we have sunshine laws. In Florida, we are now advising our clients, if you do any sort of incident reporting, make sure that it's not subject to the sunshine law. You don't want someone to be able to come in and see that you got compromised, right? The good guys can see it, but so can the bad guys. You don't want that. So we're having to actually come back and take another look at sunshine laws. And then finally, bills for countermeasures. Now, if you have CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is a part of DHS come in and actually do an assessment for you, be careful. They're going to look at worst case scenario. They're going to tell you, oh, you're wide open. You got holes everywhere. You better do something now because you're going to get hit tomorrow. Maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> you want to look at the likelihood. You want to look at the controls you already have in place. But they're going to look at it from a worst case scenario. They do offer the service. Um, uh, I am part of a team called PCI ISS for Protected Critical Infrastructure Information. We're the teams that go out and will do these assessments. But again, it's worst case. Uh, you got a railroad track right there. You got to do something. What are you going to do? Pick up that treatment, move it away from the railroad track? Probably not. But you have to just simply know it's there and be able to put some contingency plans in place. What's happened? Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act was signed this year. That is the bill that's going to require incident reporting. They haven't put out guidance yet on where you're going to report this and who's going to track it. Right now in committee is Defense of the United States Critical Infrastructure Act. That was introduced in 2021. It is likely going to be signed this year. Uh, pending White House signature, Strengthening America's Cybersecurity Act. And again, this is a hodgepodge, uh, but basically what it's getting to is Monitor your systems, know where you, what assets are connected to your systems, and be able to report incidents to the right agencies. Now, I've got a couple of highlights in here. The EPA is about to put out a rule, which is kind of surprising to me, because EPA is a bunch of scientists and doctors. They don't know a whole lot about <clears throat> uh, security. But the EPA is about to publish some cybersecurity standards that are going to be applicable to the drinking water side. Drinking water has historically been uh, 
uh, regulated from the perspective of quality and safety. Is the water safe to drink and does it taste good? Now we're going to see reliability get pulled into that. We're going to see the security of those systems get pulled into that. There's also Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act, DWWIA, that has been passed. And then there is lots of money that's been proposed. There are billions of dollars that have been proposed. But the problem there and the challenge there is what vehicles get funded and how do you apply for those? That's always an incredible challenge. I sit on the Hill and I advise these committees and I have no idea where half of this money sits. So I got to go and figure it out myself. Um, regulatory initiatives. Uh, there have been increases for EPA funding, 21% proposed this year. That's uh, closer to about 12 billion. Uh, about a third of that uh, is designated for water infrastructure and security. So uh, infrastructure improvements. Drinking water funding for the future, there's about 100 and, I'm sorry, about 11, almost 12 billion that has been allocated. We expect that number to go up. Um, there is increased WIFIA credit assistance if you have applied for WIFIA funding before. And then drinking water, uh, state drinking water revolving fund loan programs. These typically run out of money about halfway into the year if you've applied for those before. We're seeing an increase in that funding, but we're also going to start seeing um, eligibility requirements. If you're not doing certain things to secure your system, you may not be eligible for some of this funding. So keep that in mind. All right. <clears throat> so earlier this year in January, the White House, along with a number of agencies, EPA and DHS specifically, introduced what was called the 100 day water sector action plan. And what they wanted to do was not necessarily put out guidance to water system owners and operators, but start to look at the federal government. Who should be looking at this from a regulatory perspective? The two agencies, the two primacy agencies that are really in play here are EPA and DHS. EPA from the safety and quality perspective, historically that's where they've lived. And then DHS more from the security perspective. So you're gonna start seeing DHS get more involved. So <clears throat> from January 27th to the 7th of May, that 100 day plan ran. And what it was designed to do is to start getting the federal government positioned to take a harder look at the water sector. Wasn't a challenge to the water sector itself. It was, okay, regulators, what do we need to do? Who needs to be on first? Who needs to be on second? So what does this look like? It established a coordination framework across those primacy agencies. Primacy that you're going to see are EPA, DHS, specifically CESA, the, uh, and the Water Sector Coordinating Council. There was a consortium of water system owners and operators that were assembled that worked with regulators to start developing a set of common standards. Those standards have been set now. Uh, there was encouragement for information sharing. There was promotion of cybersecurity monitoring and incident reporting. And there was a pilot program launched with several select utilities, started with the large utilities and then filtered down to some of the medium-sized utilities. If you recall, EPA has designations for large, medium, and small utilities. Small utilities are 50,000 and lower. Uh, mediums are 50 to 100,000 and then larger 100,000 and, and higher four meter customers. What came out of this, a detailed mandatory cybersecurity standards to secure industrial control systems. What does this mean? There is now a regulatory oversight uh, group uh, set up. It's called the Water Risk and Resilience Organization. If you're familiar with the power side, power has what's called NERC, North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Water now has a companion to NERC. NERC oversees water. NERC provides enforcement for what's called the SIP standards, critical infrastructure protection. We're about to see the same thing happen to water. It did codify NIST cybersecurity framework as the foundational control system guidance. So you're gonna see more and more uh, of your guidance foundationed on that. It is going to require system operators to report incidents. Now look at that next bullet there. This has not been codified yet, but OEA was set on a five year uh, schedule could be three years now. So if you certified in 2020, you may have to certify again in 2023 if that passes. There's additional uh, set asides for funding. There will be eligibility requirements for certain non-loan funds or grants. And then I keep highlighting this because I want you to be aware of it. You will be required to comply with cybersecurity standards. What does this look like? 
utilities will see additional regulation. Think NERC and SIP for water. There will be requirements to comply with published cyber standards, and you're going to have to demonstrate compliance in order to qualify for certain funding. Eventually, that's going to become punitive. So <clears throat> critical infrastructure uh, security actions. Again, this is just a, a timeline of progression here. You see water over there on the far right. Uh, which is really being governed right now under that ICS initiative that was signed last year and National Student Memorandum, Memorandum Number 5. All right, <clears throat> what does this look like? Expansion of oversight authority. You're going to see DHS get involved. Delegation of primacy to the states. Most states actually have a Department of Environmental Protection or something like that. You're going to see the states typically be the first level of support and enforcement for this. EPA and DHS are going to be federal level, so they're going to be level two. Requiring monitoring, there will be a requirement for reporting, and then there's going to be an encouragement to actually prayer, uh, share threat information. What do you want to look out for? Make sure you know what's connected to your ICS. Make sure that you know what assets are connected out there. If you don't know what assets are connected to your networks, how can you secure them and control them? You can't. Power has this requirement already. You're going to monitor your control systems. You're going to set up a process for incident reporting and management. You want to pay attention to patch management. Think about some of the, uh, the devices you have out there. They haven't been patched in years. I walk in and I find uh, you know, a PLC that's sitting out there 20 years old, hadn't been patched. May not be able to be patched, may be too old. Okay, that, may, that should trigger uh, you know, some sort of a review and say maybe we need to replace these things. There's some money. Change management. If you make a change to your system, document that change. Can't stress this enough. You can't just have someone go out and make change and not document that change out there. And then finally, pay attention to physical security. Now, this doesn't mean put bollards up around you know, every lift station you've got out there. That's not feasible. But pay attention when you're putting these assets out. Look, at, look around. Look at the, the threat environment. If you're putting a, a pump station or a lift station close to a roadway, the threat may not be, you know, someone trying to come along and blow it up. Threat may be a truck coming along, you know, steering, you know, veering off the highway and crashing into it. Okay. Probably face that now anyway. What do you want to look for? Safety and quality are, have historically always been uh, first and foremost from a regulatory. Now you're going to look at reliability. State of Texas last year had ice storms blow through, and now the state has signed legislation requiring uh, water system operators and owners to ensure that no less than 20 pounds um, uh, per square inch of water is available at every tap. Problem is, that's not a water problem, that's a power problem. So, <clears throat> you guys want me to keep going? I'm, I'm being uh, pushed for <laughs> time here. You want to make sure that you have control around your OT environments. Make sure you know what's in those OT environments. And then finally, start looking ahead at regulatory compliance specifically around your, uh, your control systems. A little bit of a framework here. You want to develop a security strategy and a plan. You want to make sure that you have an accurate inventory. When I walk in and do an assessment on the power side, if those operators show me a written inventory that doesn't match what's on the floor or what's out in that substation. I stop, violate, walk out. Done. <clears throat> Don't have time for it. Make sure that you know what's connected in there. All right, a little bit on ARPA. There is going to be new funding come out for ARPA, so pay attention to that. If you, a lot of utilities were able to get some ARPA funding. Repair and replace aging infrastructure, but look at uh, developing a cybersecurity management plan and a roadmap. So we're starting to see more emphasis around security. What can you do? Ensure that you have an accurate asset inventory and a network topology. Simple as a network diagram, make sure it's accurate. Review your incident management, your ERPs. Uh, and that's not a one and done, keep doing that. Ensure that you have defined incident reporting protocols. Okay, something happens, who do you talk to first, second, third? When do you involve law enforcement? Review your policies. Utility policies, municipal policies. A lot of utilities rely on muni policies. Look at uh, monitoring. Promote cybersecurity training. Many of you do this already, but a lot of times it's only when you hire someone. Do it annually. Review your OEA findings. And then finally, integrate cybersecurity into your capital improvement plans. Best way to do it. Power went through the same issues here. 
quick poll question for drinking water operators. Have you used your OEA, risk and resilience assessment? And have you done anything with it? Or did you just do it, check the box, send it, send the executive letter off and say, done with that for five years? That the intent with that is to get your attention on the things that are important. So always pull that out. I may have gone a little over, but I think I'm good. So <laughs> any questions? I know I went through this fairly quickly, but anything not make sense? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank, you for thank you for giving me some more material to keep me up at night. <laughs> I am uh, you most of it referred generally to the water sector. And I'm, I'm just curious whether you see a difference either in terms of vulnerability or in terms of the attractiveness of the target between water and wastewater? Great question. Right now, DHS has water and wastewater together. I don't think wastewater is going to have the same attention, if you will, that water has. I think I don't think DHS is going to create a 17th sector and call it wastewater. But what I think is going to happen is DHS and EPA are going to say drinking water is really the most important. Wastewater needs to be aware of these things, but I don't see wastewater being front and center and on the same level going forward. I just don't. Great question, though. Excellent. There, yes. What are your thoughts of uh, cloud servers and data up on the cloud so people can get to them? Uh, is there a real security threat on that or not? Now you're going to make me uh, actually open the kimono here a bit. There is a place for cloud services. What you have to keep in mind is when you push your data up to a cloud service, a cloud provider, you are giving them control of that data and you're relying on their security controls. What I would say is I am not in favor of putting a SCADA in the cloud. SCADA vendors are now pushing, oh yeah, we can, we can manage you from anywhere. So can a bad guy from anywhere in the world. Now, does that mean you keep your SCADA local? Not necessarily, but I am not a, a, a fan right now because I don't think cloud providers have enough security controls in place to keep that SCADA safe. So I guess my answer to you is I'm not a fan of it right now from a critical infrastructure uh, structure perspective, but it's coming. We're gonna have to push the cloud providers to actually separate those environments out because we have enhanced security controls that we have to have in place. One more. Hey, um, <clears throat> so I know that you mentioned that uh, the WRRO is gonna act like NERCSIP in the water sector, but I'm very sure that NERCSIP has some very heavy handed uh, fines that it can dish out. Is that gonna to come to the water sector? Most definitely right now. The, uh, the fee structure that we're seeing is up to, depending on the severity of the, of the uh, finding, up to 6% of operating revenue. That's heavy. But NERC has some very stiff fines that they can levy against uh, electric utilities. But I mean, electric utilities, it's a love-hate with, with NERC SIP. NERC SIP, it, the SIP standards are really good but they're really poorly written. They reference a whole lot of things back and forth. And before you know it, you've got a chain of you know, 20, 20 lines. So if this, oh, I gotta go over here. If this, it's, it's hard to manage. But yeah, there will be punitive assessments coming at some point. Great, everybody, thank you, Mark. Thank you.